Okay. Um, I'm in chapter 23. I'm on page 48. I'm gonna try to go to 498. I might have to split this first part into two videos because my brother's eating dinner and he might show up in the middle of it. I'm very hungry. Also, I don't have a drink. I have this Gatorade, I guess. I don't know. That'll suffice. Okay. Page 48. The population of post-Civil War Republic continued to vault upward by, the vigor by vigorous leaps, despite the awful bloodletting in both the Union and Confederate ranks. Census takers reported over 39 million people in 1870, gaining 46.6% over the pre preceding decade, as the immigrant tide surged again. The United States was now the third largest nation in the Western world, ranking behind Russia and France. But the civic health of the United States did not keep pace with its physical growth. The Civil War and its aftermath spawned waste, extravagance, speculation, and graft. Disillusionment ran deep among idealistic Americans in the post-war era. They had spilled their blood for the Union, Emancipation, and Abraham Lincoln, who had promised a new birth of freedom. Instead, they got a bitter dose of corruption and political, stale political stalemate, beginning with Ulysses S. Grant, a great soldier but an early enough politician. The bloody shirt elects Grant. Wrangling between Congress and President Andrew Johnson had soured the people and professional politicians in the Reconstruction era, and the notion still prevailed that a good, deal, that a good general would make a good president. Stubbly bearded General Grant was by far the most popular northern hero to emerge from the war. Grateful citizens of Philadelphia, Washington, and his hometown of Galena, Illinois, passed the hat in each place for presented him with a house. New Yorkers tendered him a check for $105,000. The general, silently puffing on a cigar, unapologetically accepted these gifts as just his desserts for having rescued the Union. Grant was a hapless greenhorn in the political arena. His one presidential vote had been cast for the Democratic ticket in 1856, a better judge of horse flesh than of humans. His cultural background was breathtakingly narrow. He once reportedly remarked that Venice, Italy, would be a fine city if only it were drained. The Republicans, freed from the Union Party coalition of war days, enthusiastically nominated Grant for the presidency in 1868. The party's platform sounded a clarion call for continued reconstruction of the South under the glight blending steel of federal bayonets. Yet Grant, always a man of few words, struck a highly popular note in his letter of acceptance when he said, let us have peace. This noble sentiment became a leading campaign slogan and was later engraved on his tomb beside the Hudson River. Expecting Demo- <coughs> <coughs> Oh, excuse me. <coughs> Expecting Democrats meeting in their own nominating convention denounced military reconstruction, but could agree on little else. Wealthy Eastern delegates demanded a plan promising the federal war bonds be redeemed in gold, even though many of the bonds have been purchased with badly depreciated paper greenbacks. Poor Midwestern dele delegates. I can't read. Poor Midwestern delegates answered with the Ohio idea, which called for redemption in greenbacks. Debt burdened agrarian Democrats that hoped to keep the war money in circulation and keep interest rates low. <laughs> keep interest rates lower. This dispute introduced a bitter contest over monetary policy that continued to convulse the republic until the century's end. Midwestern delegates got the platform, but not the candidate. The nominee, former New York Governor Horatio Seymour, scuttled the Democrats' faint hope for success by repudiating the Ohio idea. Republicans whipped up enthusiasm for Grant by energetically waving the bloody shirt, that is, reviving glory of me reviving gory memories of the Civil War, which became for the first time a prominent feature of a presidential campaign. Vote as you shot was a powerful Republican slogan aimed at the Union Army veterans. Grant won, but with 214... Wait... Grant won with 214 electoral votes to 80 for Seymour, but the formal general scored a majority of only 300,000 in the popular vote. Most white voters apparently supported Seymour, and the ballots of three still unreconstructed southern states, Mississippi, Texas, and Virginia, were not counted at all. An estimated 500,000 former slaves gave Grant and his gave Grant his margin of victory. To remain in power, the Republican Party somehow had continued to control the South and to keep the ballot in the hands of the grateful freedmen. Republicans could not take future victories for granted. The Era of Good Stealings a few skunks can pollute a large area. Although the great majority of business people and government officials continue to conduct their affairs with decency and honor, the whole post-war atmosphere stunk of corruption. The man in the moon, it was said, had to hold his nose when passing over America. Freewheeling railroad promoters sometimes left gullible bond buyers with only two streaks of rust and a right of way. Unethical stock market manipulators were a cinder in the public eye. Too many judges and legislators put their power up for hire. Cynics defined an honest politi politician as one who, when bought, would stay bought. <clears throat> Notorious in the financial wor world were two millionaire partners, Jubilee Jim Fisk and Jay Gold. The corpulent and unscrupulous Fisk provided the brass, while the undersized and cunning gold provided the brains. The crafty pair concocted a plot in 1869 to corner the gold market. Their slippery game would work only if the federal treasury refrained from selling gold. The conspirators worked on President Grant directly and also through his brother-in-law, who received 25000 for his complicity. For weeks, Fisk and Gold madly bid the price of gold skyward so they would later profit in its heightened value. But on Black Friday, September 24, 1869, the bubble broke when the treasury, contrary to Grant's supposed assurances, was compelled to release gold. The price of gold plunged, and scores of honest business people were driven to the wall. A congressional probe concluded that Grant had done nothing crooked, though he had acted stupidly and indiscreetly. <clears throat> 
The infamous tweed ring in New York City vividly displayed the ethics or, or lack of ethics typical of the age. Burly Boss Tweed, 240 pounds of rascality, employed bribery, graft, and fraudulent elections to milk the metropolis as much of, of as much as $200 million. <coughs> I'm really dying. Oh, my God. Uh, and blah, 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 blah. Honest citizens were cowed into silence. Protesters found their tax assessments raised. Tweed's luck finally ran out. The New York Times secured damning evidence in 1871 and courageously published it, though offered $5 million not to do so. Gifted cartoonist Thomas Nas pilloried Tweed mercilessly after spending a heavy bribe to the cyst. The portly thief reportedly complained that his illiterate followers could not help seeing them damn pictures. New York attorney Samuel J. Tilden had headed the prosecution, gaining fame, gaining fame that later paved the path to his presidential nomination. Unveiled and unwept, Tweed died behind bars. A carnival of corruption. More serious than Boss Tweed's peccadilloes were the misdeeds of the federal government. President Grant's cabinet was a rodent's nest of grafters and incompetence. Favor seekers haunted the White House, supplying Grant himself with cigars, wines, and horses. His election was a godsend to his in laws of the Dent family, several dozen of whom attached themselves to the public payroll. The easygoing Grant was the first was first tarred by the Credit Mobilier scandal, which erupted in eighteen seventy two. Union Pacific Railroad insiders had formed the Credit Mobilier Construction Com Company and then cleverly hire hired themselves at, at inflated prices to build the railroad line, earning dividends as high as 348%. Fearing that Congress might blow the whistle, the company feuded. <coughs> <coughs> The company furtively distributed shares of its valuable stock to key congressmen. A newspaper expose and congressional investigation of the scandal led to the formal censure of two congressmen and the revelation that the vice president of the United States had accepted payments from a credit mobilier. The breath of scandal in <coughs> God, my God, I'm sorry. In Washington also reeked of alcohol. In 1874 to 1875, the sprawling whiskey ring robbed the treasury of millions in excise task revenues. Let no guilty man escape, declared President Grant, but when his own private secretary turned up among the culprits, he volunteered a written statement to the jury that helped exonerate the thief. Further rottenness in the Grant administration came to light in 1876, forcing the Secretary of War, William Belknap, Belknap to resign after pocketing bribes from suppliers to the Indian reservations. Grant, ever loyal to his crooked cronies, accepted Belknap's res resignation with great regret. <coughs> the liberal... <coughs> <coughs> No, my throat really hurts. By 1872, a powerful wave of disgust with the Grantism was beginning to build up throughout the nation, even before some of the worst scandals had been exposed. I have to talk in a different voice now because my throat hurts so much. Reform-minded citizens banded together to form the Liberal Republican Party, voicing the slogan, Turn the Rascals Out. They urged purification of the Washington administration as well as an end to military reconstruction. The Liberal Republicans muffed their chance when their Cincinnati nominated convention astounded the country by nominating the brilliant but erratic Horace Greeley for the presidency. Although Greeley was the fearless editor of, New York, the of the New York Tribune, he was dogmatic, emotional, petulant, and notoriously unsound in his political judgments. More astonishing still was the action of the office-hungry Democrats, who foolishly proceeded to endorse Greeley's candidacy. In swallowing Greeley, the Democrat, Democrats ate Cal in large gulps, for, eccentric, for the eccentric editor had long blasted them as traitors, slave shippers, saloon keepers, horse thieves, and idiots. Yet Greeley pleased the Democrats north and south when he pleaded for clasping hands across the bloody chasm. The Republicans dutifully renominated Grant. The voters were thus presented with a choice between two, two candidates who had made their careers in fields other than politics and who were both eminently unqualified, by temperament and lifelong training, for high political office. In the months of campaign that followed, regular Republicans denounced Greeley as an atheist, a communist, a free lumber, a vegetarian, and a signer of Jefferson Davis's bail bond. Bail bond. Democrats der derided Grant as ignoramus, a drunkard, and a swindler. Swindler, but that the, but the regular Republicans chanting "Grant us another term" pulled the president through. The count in the electoral column was 206, 286 to sixty-six. In the popular column, big number to other bigger num to other big number. Okay. Liberal Republican agitation frightened the regular Republicans into cleaning their own house before they were thrown out of it. The Republican Congress in eighteen seventy-two passed a General Amnesty Act, removing political disabilities from all but some five hundred former Confederate leaders. Congress also removed to reduce the civil war, the high civil war tariffs, and to fumigate the Grant administration with a mild service reform. Like many American third parties, the liberal Republicans left some enduring footprints, even in defeat. Depression, deflation, and inflation. Grant's woes deepened in the paralyzing economic panic of 1873. Bursting with startling rapid, ra rapid, rapidity, the, oh, my chest hurts. 
The crash was one of those periodic plummets that rollercoastered the economy in this age of unbridled capitalist expansion. Overreaching promoters had laid more railroad tracks, sunk more mines, erected more factories, and sowed more grain fields than existing markets could bear. Bankers, in turn, had made too many imprudent loans to finance those enterprises. When profits failed to materialize, loans went unpaid, and the whole credit-based house of cards fluttered down. The United States did not suffer alone. Nations worldwide underwent a similar economic collapse in 1873. Boom times became gloom times, as more than 50,000 American businesses went bankrupt. In New York City, an army of unemployed Riotously, riotous, un, of unemployed riotously battled police. Black Americans were hard hit. The Freedman Savings, Savings and Trust Company had made unsecured loans to several companies that went under. Black depositors who had entrusted over $7 million to the bank lost their savings, and black economic development and black confidence in savings institutions went down with it. Hard times inflicted the worst punishment on debtors, who intensified their clamor for inflationary policies. Proponents of inflation breathed new life into the issue of greenbacks. During the war, $450 million of the folding money had been issued, but it had appreciated under a cloud of popular mistrust and dubious legality. By 1866, the Treasury had already withdrawn $100 million of the battle-borne currency from circulation, and hard money people everywhere looked forward to its complete disappearance. But now afflicted agrarian and debtor groups, cheap money supporters, clamored for a re reissuance of the greenbacks. With a crude but essentially accurate grasp of monetary theory, they reasoned that the more money meant cheaper money and, hence, rising prices and e easier to pay debts. Creditors, of course, reasoning from the same premises, advocated precisely the opposite policy. They had no desire to see the money they had loaned repaid in, a, in depreciated dollars. They wanted deflation, not inflation. The hard money advocates carried the day. In 1874, they persuaded a confused grant to veto a bill to print more paper money. They scored another victory in the Resumption Act of 1875, which pledged the government to the further withdrawal of greenbacks from circulation and to the redemption of all paper currency and gold at face value, beginning in 1879. Down but not out, debtors now looked to the relief to another pr precious metal, silver. The sacred white metal, they claimed, had received a raw deal. In the late 1870s, the Treasury stubbornly and unrealistically maintained that an ounce of silver was worth only one sixteenth as much as an ounce of gold, though open market prices for silver were higher. Silver mine thus stopped offering their shiny product for sale to the federal mints. With no silver flowing into the federal coffers, Congress formally dropped the coinage of silver dollars in 1873. Fate then played a sly joke when new silver discoveries later in the 1870s shot production up and forced silver prices down. Westerners from silver mining states joined with debtors in assailing the crime of 73, demanding a return to the dollar of our daddies. Like the demand for more greenbacks, the demand for the coinage of more silver was nothing more nor less than another scheme to promote inflation. <coughs> oh my god. Ah, okay. Hard money Republicans resisted the scheme and counted on Grant to hold the line against it. He did not disappoint them. The Treasury began to accumulate gold stocks against the appointed day for the res resumption of me metallic money payments. Coupled with the reduction of greenbacks, this policy was called contraction. It had a no noticeable deflationary effect. The amount of money per capita in circulation actually decreased between 1870 and 1880, from 1942 to 1937. Dollars. Contraction probably worsened the impact of the Depression, but the new policy did restore the government's credit rating, and it brought the embattled greenbacks up to their full face value. When Redemption Day came in 1879, a few greenback holders both bothered to exchange the lighter and more convenient bills for gold. Republican hard money policy had a political backlash. It helped elect a Democratic House of Representatives in 1874, and in 1878 it spawned the Greenback Labor Party, which polled over a million votes and elected 14 members of Congress. The contest over monetary policy was far from over. Pallet politics in the Gilded Age. The politics seesaw was delicately balanced through most of the Gilded Age, a sarcastic name given by Mark Twain in 1873 to the three-decade-long post-Civil War era. Even a slight nudge could tip the teeter tart to the advantage of the opposition party. Every presidential election was a squeaker, and the majority party in the House of Representatives switched six times in the 11 sessions between 1869 and 1891. In the only three sessions did the same party control the House, the Senate, and the White House. Wobbling in such shakily, shaky equilibrium, polit politicians tiptoed timidly, producing a political record that was often trivial and petty. Few significant economic issues separated the major parties. Democrats and Republicans saw very nearly eye to eye on questions like the tariff and civil service reform, and majorities in both parties substantially agreed even on the much debated currency question. Yet despite their rough agreement on these national matters, the two parties were ferociously competitive with each other. They were tightly and efficiently organized, and they committed fierce loyal loyalty from their members. Voter turnouts reached heights unmatched before or since. Nearly 80% of eligible voters cast their ballots in presidential elections in the three decades after the Civil War. On election days, droves of the party faithful tramped behind marching bands to polling to the polling places and ticket splitting or failing to vote the straight party line was as rare as a silver dollar 
How can this apparent paradox of political consensus and partisan f- fervor be explained? The answer lies in the sharp ethnic and cultural differences in the membership of the two parties, in distinctions of style and tone, and especially of religious sentiment. Republican voters tended to adhere to those, cre- to those creeds that trace their lineage to Puritanism. They stressed strict codes of personal morality and believed that the government should play a role in regulating both their economic and their moral affairs of society. Democrats, among whom immigrant Lu- Lutherans and Roman Catholics figured heavily, were more likely to adhere to faiths that took a less stern view of the human weakness. Their religions professed toleration of differences in an imperfect world, and they spurned government efforts to impose a single moral standard on the entire society. These differences in temperament and religious values often produced ra- 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 <laughs> raucous political contests at the local level. Le- level, 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 local level, where issues like prohibition and education loomed large. Democrats had a solid electoral base in the South and, and in. I literally can't read. Democrats had a solid electoral base in the South and in the northern industrial cities, teeming with immigrants and controlled by a well-oiled. Pol- Ah, controlled by well-oiled political machines. Republican strength lay largely in the Midwest and in the rural, rural and small-town Northeast. Grateful freedmen in the South continued to vote Republican in significant numbers. Another important fact block of Another important block of Republican ballots came from the members of the Grand Army of the Republic, GAR, a politically potent fraternal organization of several hundred thousand Union veterans of the Civil War. Excuse me. The lifeblood of both parties was patronage, dis- dis- dispersing jobs by the bucket full in return for votes, kickbacks, and party service. Boisterous infighting over patronage beset the Republican Party in the 1870s and 1880s. A stalwart faction, led by the handsome and imperious Roscoe, Lord Roscoe Conkling, U.S. Senator from New York, unblushingly embraced the time-honored system of swapping civil service jobs for votes. Opposed to the Conklingites were the so-called half-breeds, who, feared a co- who flirted coyly with the civil service reform, but whose real quarrel with the stalwarts was over who should grasp a ladle that dished out the spoil. The champion of the half-breeds was James G. Blaine of Maine, a radiantly personable personable congressman with an elastic conscience. But despite the color of their personalities, Conkling and Blaine succeeded only in stalemating each other and deadlocking their party. The Hayes Tillman Standoff, 1876. Hangers on around Grant, like fleas urging their ailing dog to live, begged the old man to try for a third term in 1876. The general, blind to his own ineptitude, showed a disquieting willingness, but the House, by a lopsided bipartisan vote of 233 to 18, derailed the third term bandwagon. It passed a resolution that sternly reminded, reminded the. Qu- reminded the country and Grant of the anti-dictator implications of the two-term tradition. With Grant out of the running and with Clonkingites and Blainites neutralizing each other, the Republicans turned to a compromised candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, who was obscure enough to be dubbed the Great Unknown. His foremost qualification was the fact that he hailed from the electorally doubtful but potent state of Ohio, where he had served three terms as governor. So crucial were the swing votes of Ohio in the cliffhanging presidential contests of the day that the state produced more than its share of presidential candidates. A political saying of the 1870s paraphrased Shakespeare. Some were born great some achieve greatness, and some are born in Ohio. Pitted against the humdrum haze was the Democratic nominee, Samuel G. Samuel J. Tilden, who had risen to fame as a man who bagged boss tweeted New York. Campaigning against Republican scandal, Tilden racked up 184 electoral votes of the needed 185, with 20 votes in four states, three of them in the South, doubtful because of the irregular returns. Surely Tilden could pick up at least one of these, especially in the view of the fact that he had polled 247,448 more popular votes than Hayes. A big number to small number. Both parties scurried to send visiting statesmen to the contested southern states of Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. All three disputed states submitted two sets of returns, one Democratic and one Republican. As the weeks drifted by, their paralysis tightened, generating generating a dramatic constitutional crisis. The Constitution merely specifies that the electoral returns from the states shall be sent to Congress, and in the presence of the House and Senate, they shall be opened by the President of the Senate. See the Twelfth Amendment in the appendix. But who should count them? On this point, the Constitution was silent. If counted by the President of the Senate, a Republican, the Republican return would be selected. If counted by the Speaker of the House, a Democrat, the Democratic return would be chosen. How could the impasse be resolved? The Compromise of 1877 and the End of Reconstruction Clash or compromise was the tar- was the stark choice. The danger loomed that there would be no president in the inauguration day, March 4, 1877. Tilden or blood, cried Democratic hotheads, and some of their Minutemen began to drill with arms. But behind the scenes, frantically laboring statesmen gradually hammered out an agreement in the Henry Clay tradition, the Compromise of 1877. The election deadlocked itself was to be broken by the Electoral Count Act, which Congress passed early in 1877. It set up an electoral commission consisting of 15 men selected from the Senate, the House, and the Supreme Court. In February 1877, about a month before inauguration day, the Senate and the House met together in an, elect- 
in an electric atmosphere to settle the dispute. The role of the states was, to was told off alphabetically. When Florida was reached, the first of the three southern states with the two sets of returns, the disputed documents were referred to the Electoral Commission, which sat in a nearby chamber. After prolonged discussion, the members agreed with a partisan vote of eight Republicans to seven Democrats to accept the Republican returns. Outraged Democrats in Congress, smelling defeat, undertook a launch to fill it to undertook to launch a filibuster until hell froze over. Renewed deadlock was avoided by the rest of the complex compromise of 1877, already partially concluded behind closed doors. The Democrats reluctantly agreed that Hayes might take office in return for his withdrawing intrusive federal troops from the two states in which they remained, Louisiana and South Carolina. Among various concessions, the Republicans assured the Democrats a place at the presidential patronage trial and... Ah, my foot just went numb. That's painful. Oh, God. Where was I? Um... Uh, something, 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 chow, chow, I lost my place. Uh oh. Oh, oh, there it is. The Republicans assured the Democrats a place at the presidential patronage shelf in support for the bill subsiding, subsi subsidizing the Texas and Pacific Railroad's construction of a southern transcontinental line. Not all of these promises were kept in later years, including the Texas and Pacific subsidy, but the deal held together long enough to break the dangerous electoral standoff. The Democrats permitted Hayes to receive the remainder of the disputed returns, all by the partisan vote of 8 to 7. So close was the margin of safety that the explosive issue was settled only three days before the new president was officially sworn into office. The nation breathed a collective sigh of relief. The compromise bought peace at price. Partisan violence was averted by sacrificing the civil rights of Southern blacks. With the hayes tilden deal, the Republican Party quietly abandoned its commitment to racial equality. That commitment had been weakening in any case. Many Republicans had begun to question the worthiness of Reconstruction and were less willing to send dollars and enlisted sons to bolster Southern state governments. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was, in a sense, the last feeble gasp of the Congressional Radical Republicans. The act supposedly guaranteed equal accommodations in public places and prohibited racial discrimination in jury selection, but the law was born toothless and stayed that way for nearly a century. The Supreme Court pronounced much of the act unconstitutional in the civil rights cases, 1883. The court declared that the four that the 14th Amendment prohibited only government violations of civil rights, not the denial of civil rights by individuals. When President Hayes withdrew, a blue -clad f withdrew the blue-clad federal troops that were propping up Reconstruction governments, the bayonet black Republican regimes collapsed. Excuse me. Okay, uh, the birth of Jim Crow in the post-Reconstruction South. The Democratic South speedily solidifi solidified and swiftly suppressed the now friendless blacks. Reconstruction, for better or worse, was officially ended. Shamelessly relying on fraud and intimidation, white Democrats, redeemers, reassumed political power in the South and exercised it ruthlessly. Blacks who tried to assert their rights faced unemployment, eviction, and physical harm. Many blacks, as well as poor whites, were forced into sharecropping and tenant farming. Former slaves often found themselves at the mercy of former masters who were now their landlords and creditors. Through the cropland system, storekeepers extended credit to small farmers for food and supplies, and in return took a lion, a lion, lion lean on their harvests. Shrewd merchants manipulated the system so that farmers remained perpetually in debt to them. For generations to come, Southern blacks were condemned to eke out, to eke out a threadbare living under conditions scarcely better than slavery. With white Southerners back in the political saddle, daily discrimination against blacks grew increasingly oppressive. What had started as the informal separation of blacks and whites in the immediate post-war years developed by the 1890s into systematic state-level legal codes of segregation known as Jim, Jim Crow laws. Southern states also enacted literacy requirements, voter registration laws, and poll taxes, and tolerated violent intimidation of black voters to ensure full-scale disenfranchisement of the South's freedmen. The Supreme Court validated the South's recreationist social order in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson and ruled that separate but equal facilities were constitutional under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. But in reality, the quality of African American life was grotesquely unequal to that of whites. Segregated in inferior schools and separated from whites in virtually all public faci facilities, including railroad cars, theaters, and even restrooms, blacks were assaulted daily by the gay by the galling reminders of their second-class citizenship. To ensure the stability of this political and economic new order, Southern whites dealt harshly with any black who dared to violate the South's racial code of conduct. A record number of blacks were lynched during the 1890s, most often for the crime of asserting themselves as equals. It would take a second reconstruction, nearly a century later, to redress the races and balance of the, sun of the Southern society. Class conflicts and ethnic clashes. The year 1877 marked more than the end of Reconstruction. As the curtains officially closed on regional warfare, they opened on scenes of class struggle. The explosive atmosphere was largely a byproduct of the long years of depression and deflation following the Panic of 1873. Railroad workers faced particularly hard times when they watched the railroads continue to rake in huge profits. When the presidents of the nation's four largest railroads collectively decided in 1877 to cut employees' wages by 10%, the workers struck back. President Hayes' decision to call in federal troops to quell the unrest brought the striking laborers and outpouring of work 
working class support. Work stoppages spread like wildfire in cities from Baltimore to St. Louis. When the battling between workers and soldiers ended after several weeks, over 100 people were dead. The failure of the Great Railroad Strike exposed the weakness of the labor movement in the face of massive and government intervention on the side of the railroads. The federal courts, U.S. Army, state militias, and local police all lent their muscle to keeping the engines of big business operating at full throttle, and the workers be damned. Meanwhile, racial and ethnic fissures among the workers fractured labor unity. Divisions were particularly acute between the Irish and the Chinese in California. By 1880, the Golden State counted 75,000 Asian newcomers, about 9% of its entire population. Mostly poor, uneducated, single males, they derived predominantly from the Taishan Daishan district of, of Guangdong province in southern China. They had originally come to America to dig in the gold fields and to sledgehammer the tracks of the cons- tra- I can't read. transcontinental railroad across the west. When the gold supply petered out and the tracks were laid, many perhaps, many, perhaps half of those who arrived before the 1880s returned home to China with their meager savings. Those who remained in America faced extraordinary hardships. They worked in the most mental menial jobs, often as cooks, laundrymen, or domestic servants. Without women or families, they were deprived of the children who, in other immigrant communities, eased their parents' assimilation through their exposure to the English language and American customs in school. The phrase, not a Chinaman's chance, emerged in this era not to describe the da- wait emerged in this era to describe the daunting odds against which they struggled. In San Francisco, Irish-born demagogue, de- demagogue, demagogue, de- de- I can't. Dennis Kearney, oh my god, incited his followers to violent abuse of the hapless Chinese. The Kearneyites, many of whom were recently arrived immigrants from Europe, hotly resented the competition of cheap labor from the still more recently arrived Chinese. The beef eater, they claimed, had no chance against the rice eater in a life and death struggle for jobs and wages. The present tens of thousands of Chinese coolies were regarded as a menace. The prospective millions of the prospective millions as a calamity. Taking to the streets, gangs of Kearneyites terrorized the Chinese by shearing off their precious pigtails. Some victims were murdered outright. Congress slammed the door on Chinese immigrant laborers when it passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, prohibiting nearly all further immigration from China. The door stayed shut until 1943. Some exclusionists even tried to, tried to strip native-born Chinese Americans of their citizenship, but the Supreme Court ruled in U.S. v. Wong Kim Ark in 1898 that the 14th Amendment guaranteed citizenship to all persons born in the United States. This doctrine of birthright citizenship, or jus soli, the right of the soil, as contrasted with Jus Sangui, Jus, ju, I literally can't read Latin, uh, the right of the blood tie, which based citizenship on the parents' nationality, provided important protections to Chinese Americans as well as to other immigrant communities. Okay. Wow, yes, yeah, 498. That is all. I feel so bad that I, like, I had to, like, go from, like, talking like this to, like, talking like this because, oh, my God, my throat hurts. Okay, cool. First, I have a chapter 98.